Hi. Hi, Robin. How are you? And Hi. Anshul's joining us as well. Great to see you. Thanks for having us at your beautiful home. Nice Thank to you. see you this morning. <laughs> so this is it. India is your home now. I mean, absolutely right. If you just take a look around, you've built a beautiful property, and you seem so uh, you know at home as well with the pets and uh, you know loads of your interests and so forth. Tell us a little bit about how the journey's been. Look, I'm an Indian by heart, mm. so I carry a U.S. passport, but my passport here has always been Indian. So for me, it is an easier journey. I was always, I felt an Indian while I was in the U.S. Right. So I'm, very, I'm a very proud Indian, and uh, this is homecoming for me. So I've been here now for two and a half years almost, and uh, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Robin, you had a terrible accident which perhaps prompted your move back to India. I must have you recount that story because I'm amazed at how you recovered from that incident. You actually broke your legs. Uh, you were in hospitals for almost a year. It must have been incredibly painful and difficult. It, it was. Look, Ming, I had an accident and I was headed to Augusta to watch Tiger Woods play and the limousine I was in, uh, the, the driver apparently was high on heroin, uh, 7.30 in the morning and he drove the vehicle at 200 10 kilometers an hour, uh, and the vehicle overturned and they went into a spin, three spins and so on. And here I am, and basically I had, uh, I have three screws in my, in my legs right now. Um, so it was an incredibly difficult period. So six, seven days I was in Augusta Medical Center. I, I felt like becoming a parasite. I said, I got to get out of this place. Right. So I took a flight, uh, took somebody with me just to walk, uh, be able to help me, and I came over to India. And I wrote my acquisition strategy and bought 26 companies. And so one, almost a year, I was on, a uh, year and a half, I was on crutches and on wheelchairs. Uh, but it, if anything, it teaches you a perspective. Look, yes. meaning as I went through this whole experience, the one thing that I learned is these millions and billions don't really matter, right? right? right. At exactly. that time, the only thought I had, I wanted to walk. That became my ambition in life because I didn't know whether I'll ever be able to walk. So, you know, it, it's a, it was a very humbling experience. So, you do have the parent company in the US, Ebix, and uh, you've launched Ebix Cash here in India. Was it an emotional uh, pull that brought you back to India? Was it more just the timing of it? As you said, you had a lot of time to think about how to plan your strategy. What was it? Look, it, there is always an emotional angle to uh, when you make decisions. Uh, you must bring your passion into it. And for me, India is my passion. It occurred to me as an Indian who had done something in the U.S. that I must contribute to my own country first. And so I felt that, look, if I can do something in India which can be a world beater, mm. where I can centralize something out of India, create an MNC in India that can spread out rather than bring an MNC from abroad into India. I wanted yeah. to create an MNC out of India. So that's where the dream was born. I have always been working in the charity sector, in the underprivileged sector in India, all the way you know, yeah. from 2003 onwards. But then this gave me another connect to India. And I felt this is an opportunity to contribute to the emerging India that where we are today. Tell us three things about him, Anshul. He's uh, so full of energy. We know he has a multitude of interests. Tell us, for, for those that don't know Robin so well, how would you describe him? Another, uh, <laughs> he really likes goggles and watches and some designer dresses, like something different. Has to be like, different. Yeah. Has to be different, of course. Okay, so let's have a look at these cars and bikes. Uh, I think uh, it's the bikes because we've seen that you have them in your office as well and we are going to take a look at those later. But I saw a Harley parked out front here. <laughs> so let's go have a look at it. Oh, amazing, amazing. So, tell us your story, Robin. You were born in Punjab. You're Kashmiri. I'm a Kashmiri. At what stage did you go to the US? Uh, tell us, fill in the dots for us. So, I did my schooling at, the, at a convent in Patiala, Our Lady okay. of Fatima convent, and mm -hmm. then I did my engineering in Thapars. Okay. I'm an industrial engineer by profession. So, I think I moved to Singapore in 94, and 97, I moved to the US. Okay. And uh, since then, I've been in the US. And in Atlanta, your career just went you know, spinning, didn't it, from heights to heights? Look, meaning it's a, uh, a lot of hard work, lots of sincerity, and a little bit of luck, right? And uh, things have been good. Okay, all right, so what do we have here? We've got the Harley. Which one? This is a sports bike. It's an Apache, and that's a Royal Enfield. I love riding bikes. Mm -hmm. I'm big into fast vehicles, let's put it, but yeah. it's fast cars, or whether it is. I own a Ferrari too, yes. but that's in the US. And America was lucky for you. Not everyone goes to America and, and makes their millions, uh, Robin. So what was, what was the secret ingredient? 
Look, America respects the color of money. I think we earned a lot of money for our shareholders, mm -hmm. and, and so it turned out to be a good story. All right, well, we're going to find out more about that story, of course, but I see all the bikes here. Where are the cars this morning? Well, let's walk to one. I can see that there's a lot of red. You must love the color of red. I do love the color of red, but I also love black. And you have a Ferrari. Is that red as well? Flaming red. Flaming red. Had to be. Had to be. <laughs> let's head to work then. <laughs> Bikes, the bike desk. Yep. How did you come up with this plan? Look, the bikes just convey dynamism, convergence, mm. change. What do we do in India, right? Meaning we have 65% of the people approaching the age of 35, a youthful society. Mm. So as I was doing designing this building, to my folks I said, we got to do whatever we can do to convey energy and dynamism and speed. And that's the message I wanted to leave with the youth. Talking about India and the kind of dynamism and energy you see here, the IPO market is currently, you know, in a frenzy. But you're in a really sweet spot in that sense, primed for, for the market, which is just waiting, you know, for, for more issues. When is the IPO for Evix Cash? Look, we're targeting Jan to March okay. uh, of 22. And is that delayed? Was it always no, planned no, pretty much not, next year? It's on track. You actually built, you know, a, quite a conglomerate. You have 26 acquisitions or more. So you have a very different strategy which tries to go deep into the Indian market. So look, Ebix Cash is, uh, is, is an attempt mm -hmm. to bring a paradigm shift mm -hmm. in thinking in terms of how the businesses are functioning. And if you see, the markets are, have been operating in silos. Each silo is an industry by itself. And having said that, to me, it doesn't really make sense. Right. The consumer wants to get a service at the cheapest possible price in the most competitive and efficient manner. Mm. And to me, it was obvious that the moment you bring, converge these functionalities together, your efficiency is going to improve sure. and consumer gets value and has goes to, into a one window approach. So it was obvious that if I can create an airport of sorts, a financial come insurance, come healthcare hub, you would basically converge B2C and B2B processes, front end and back end processes in any island. Nobody has thought like that. Everybody has been working in silos. Some people who've tried to get into other segments have failed. Is it because of the choice of segments or is it because of the kind of companies you've acquired? The first thing to remember is the barrier to entry is very high in these right. industries. Each of these industries is a licensed industry. Mm. And it is not that licenses are issued every other day. Part of the reason I made these acquisitions, I wanted to ensure that there is one entity now who has all these licenses. Today, we are the only one who has all these disparate licenses. Otherwise, there are people who have a license for one industry but don't have a license for the second industry. So it is not so easy to come in. Why do people sometimes fail? It is ultimately comes down to simple thought processes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes life is as simple as saying selling price has to be a lot more than the cost right. price. You would say that sounds silly, but yes, it is silly, but at the same time, that's as long as you remember that, things happen. Today, in the name of unicorns, in the name of valuation, what is happening is people think valuation is all about growth. Right. And in the process, they're willing to subsidize the consumer and they're willing to give away money. And to me, that's not a sustainable model. You've always talked about it. You've always said that you believe in profitability. What have been uh, some of the methods that you've undertaken to ensure profitability? I think the single biggest thing is financial discipline. When I walk in into any particular industry or any subsect, I will tell my managing directors, if you cannot hit 30% operating margin in that sector, to me, you're not a successful managing director. If somebody's hitting 29% and they're saying, I'm close, I'm there 1% away and I'm saying, Look, you're not at 30. I recognize you're making efforts, but we got to be above 30. So how do you do that? Financial discipline is one. Second is audit and trails. Everybody must have a check on what they do. If you can do that, then you can predict budgets. You don't get surprises at the end of the quarter. And to me, those are the basics. Then you have to be technology centric. Okay. 2001, we became, we were on demand and SaaS. We are 20 years ahead, right? So to me, uh, it was basic that we needed to be a few years ahead of our competition, in, not just in producing technology. The idea is how do you sell? Can you be more efficient than others, right? Can you create checks and balances so that people don't make classic mistakes? And then teaching people the basics, which I started with, 
selling price has to be more than cost price. Go down to that basic and things will happen. What are some of the trends or the key themes that you've observed when it comes to the Indian consumer, what they want, where the demand is, what's growing the fastest? Uh, what are some of the key things that have come up? India is the place to be in. Hmm. Today, part of it is the youth, the education of the youth. This is the largest middle class in the world, so everybody wants to be here. In India, what happens is you have trends. We are having a change in the pattern of India. The lower middle class is becoming a middle class, right? A, a middle class is becoming slightly going a little bit upward. Economically, we're not a very mature society today. We are just a young country. We got our independence in 1947. So when you look at it from there, we had to build the country from when the Britishers left to where we are today. I specifically feel the consumer in India today is most upwardly mobile, mm. hungry, a bit more materialistic than most countries, mm. good or bad, but that's a reality. Now that's good for businesses across the board, whether it is education, whether it is fintech, mm. whether it is travel. Ultimately, it comes down to what are the government's policies to nurture that. Mm. What we can do in a UPI in India, US can't do. India has done a phenomenal job in taking, digitizing the whole economy. Sure. And the basics have been set right. So at this point, it's all about adapting to all those things that are happening around you and keeping yourself in a very secular way. What I mean by secular is open architecture, mm. interface, partner with everybody, mm. create aggregation. There are so many different industries that I feel can do well in India today, mm. partly because as the consumer is going upwardly, uh, upwardly mobile, they will have disparate needs and those disparate needs, will one thing will lead to another. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's continue to walk around. You've got so many interesting corners and spaces in this office. So you actually have an uh, extended bridge, uh, Lakshman Jhula, you call it. What yes. uh, prompted you to design this with the backdrop of Times Square, I can see? Well, it's the same theme, meaning I wanted something different, blend the culture of India within. And then I thought, why not create these, recreate right. these Times Square steps? I was always fascinated by it. You know, on the other side, I can see that you've also got an extended boardroom. Is that boardroom with a glass floor? The boardroom is hanging on trusses. Uh, it really... Uh, is all metallic and clad with glass all through. That's amazing. And you've got a car flying through the air over there to give it like the ultimate effect. Uh, as if uh, it's coming through the roof, <laughs> falling down right now. Since we were talking about eBix, which are the products that for you uh, are your USP? Well, my USP is convergence, convergence, building an airport, providing a single window approach. Basically, we have foreign exchange, where India's leader yeah. in foreign exchange. Similarly, remittance, money coming into India, yeah. money going out of India, mm. uh, money moving within India, mm. that's another product for us. Uh, another product is uh, cards. Okay. So we do 5% of India's prepaid cards, gift cards, which is, that makes us the largest non-banking player in the market, just in the cards business. And then we do travel, we do two and a half billion dollars of travel. We, but the big thing, what, joins all this together is the technology. We provide the technology to banks, to insurers, to corporates in various areas. We provide technology across 44 countries yeah. today. Have you applied for an NBFC license or do you intend to? No, we, to? we haven't applied for it as yet. Okay. Oh, but there's a possibility, yes. If we just took a license, it'll be simply because we want to be intermediary in the middle. So I would rather bring in mm. six NBFCs at the back, seamlessly providing competitive solutions to consumers through the EBIX cash exchange. Do you manage to have uh, you know, fairly wide margins? What are, what's the kind of uh, you know, bandwidth that you play with? We do pretty well in most yeah, of these exactly. segments. Our margins in uh, most segments, barring gift cards, hmm. is anywhere 30 or 40%. In gift cards, it's uh, regulated activity. You, know, you come down to less than 1% margins. Uh, but then you move into travel, you're back to 22% margins. Okay. And then in technology sector, we typically average 40% margins. Okay, interesting. I'm not even surprised to see that you have a cinema here in the office. Do you actually watch movies here with the team? 
I do actually. A lot of time this room is used for training okay. or video conferencing. And uh, you've produced movies as well. Yes, I have. I'm into meaningful cinema. Yeah. Yeah, so Dilli was the one and you said it was actually uh, got to the Oscars, top 10. On yeah, the it, it went to the top 10 of the Oscars, mm. won 25 international awards across the world in uh, all kinds of countries. And uh, you, you're also a frequent visitor at Cannes. Absolutely. I, uh, meaning I, I wouldn't call myself a frequent visitor, but yeah, twice. So you'd continue to look at producing films if something meaningful came your way? Well, yes, if it is meaningful cinema. All right. Where are we now? There's a meeting room for our staff, primarily. The whole idea is kind of getting people to think. Okay. And this is a thinking room. So our staff walks in into this room. Somebody decides I'm going to lie down. And it's I'm the millennial like room. That. There are three people with holding their iPads or their laptops. And all of that comes in on a big screen and they collaborate. The whole idea is just take life easily and, Lovely. and still do your work. So do you have a millennial team here? Is it What's the age group? I it, mean, These are all young people. Young people. The majority of our staff is engineers. And you're continuing to hire because the trend seems to be so strong right now. Well, absolutely. As the business grows, we need more people. And what's the plan in terms of growth? What are, what are the kind of targets pre-IPO? Because once you file, I know I'm going to find it hard to ask you this question. So tell me now. <laughs> My CAGR as of last three years is 74%. Mm. The company is operating at uh, revenue run rate closer to 950 million for this calendar year 21 and at closer to 100 million dollars in EBITDA right now. This is the COVID hit year. As we go into 22 and 23, we expect businesses to come up. So I would like to see, you know, EBITDA at 135 to 140 million next year and 170 million upwards as I go in into uh, 23 onwards. So now the story clearly here is that you managed to keep your costs very low, Robin. Some people feel that perhaps that can have collateral damage, for instance. So I think in some of the acquisitions uh, where you may have trim staff or at least your top line staff, is that something that you've consciously done as a strategy? Absolutely. To There's always collateral damage. In the last 22 years, I made 56 acquisitions. And in 13 cases, I have bought companies in distress. Very recently, I bought a company called Trimax from NCLT, mm. and now it's a 31% operating margin business. I'm not going to be embarrassed about it. I'm very proud of it. I have a business model. If I just take the same set of people who took the business down, right. then what's the point? How am I going to make the business better? There's always a phase. I always tell people when I make acquisitions, I say, look, you're the villain right now. Mm. Do everything you have to as a villain and make all the changes. Right. In six months, you're going to be a hero because from after six months, it's all motivation. You're going to build motivation with the staff that you have kept and you will show them the window of growth, what is in it for them. And now you get into the motivational phase. But first six months, just do what you have to simply because what is the point of buying a business or entering a business line if you can't make it efficient? So there's one more space in the office that I really like. So let's uh, take the cameras there. So, Robin, you've not been, of course, subsidizing the product, but you've been spending big time on marketing, for instance, IPL, sports stars. What's the logic there? I mean, is it clearly to, of course, reach the consumer base, but are you seeing the ROI? If you look at some of the players in fintech space mm. today, my budget is a fraction okay. of their budget. Mm. I've been spending money on something that I feel is a recurring branding for the EBIT Cash franchise. Mm. Mm. And so as a part of it, we're a principal sponsor for sure. two teams. And we think the ROI is absolutely phenomenal okay. with being associated with IPL. Give me a sense of the kind of processing you do, uh, monthly, annually, the kind of GMV. Like, what's what are the kind of numbers that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. It's around 130,000 crores a year okay. that we transact virtually in India. Uh, and is that all internal cash flow? Are you look? Uh, do you have any debt on the books? The total debt come overdraft yeah. in the bank is around eight million dollars. Okay. So you can multiply okay. it by seven and a half, so 60 crores, let's call it. Sure. And but the cash in the bank is mm. 60 million dollars. So we're essentially debt free. You're on track. You've got literally no debt. In terms of where you feel the valuations will stack up vis-a-vis -vis some of the others, Look, it's a hard question to answer. Mm. Firstly, because I don't know. Mm. And secondly, because I'm not into the valuation game. Okay. My job is execution mm. and putting it out transparently 
Right. For every number out there for investors, and let the investors be the best judge. I have okay. told my bankers also the same stuff. As we get closer to the IPO, we're going to sit down, we're going to figure it out, we're going to do what is right. And it's estimated you're going to be diluting 15 to 20 percent. Do you have a decision on that yet? We haven't made a decision. It could be it's actually 10 to 20 percent that 20 we could we could go down to 10 percent. I'm also asking you as a founder and someone who's aware of the risk for investors, how can they find out the, the correct info to ensure that when they are going in for some of these fresh listings, which may also be hyped up post listing just on pure euphoria, that their investment is safe? I come from the classic old school of thought, cash talks its own language. Hmm. Watch the company's cash flows. Okay. How much cash are they producing? How much debt are they taking from hmm. outside, right? How are they running their business? How much is their profitability? What is their track record of profitability? Hmm. Uh, you know, it is, you can't just invest in a company simply because you believe the hype. You've got right. to do your homework. I've invested in companies where my stock value has come down, but I still continue to hold the stock because the company is fundamentally strong. Sure. So I have a belief that this company stock will ultimately do well. Hmm. You might get an 80% return in Vegas, but you could lose your shirt also. Right. That's a risk. And I wouldn't suggest to anybody that they should be playing blackjack with their investments. And what is the rationale for a company like yours to go to the public market at a time like this? I think the rationale is rather simple. That mm. we have, uh, it gives us the ability to grow the business. Okay. We want to grow our business, Evix Cash business, organically and inorganically. Mm. If I want to grow in France, I need to buy a French local company. First to right. own the financial relationships mm. that they have. Then using that relationship, I'll cross-sell all my services of okay. Evix Cash and then use that to generate cash. Got it. How lovely this is. So we're now seeing it from a different view to what we started with. Tell me about the Ebix Way. Our headquarters is, uh, office address is one Ebix Way. I'm very proud of it. We're the only company in Atlanta that has a road named after it. Okay. The city uh, recognized our strength as a business and the investments we were making in the city and named the road after us. Lovely. And, and what is that uh, huge painting up there? Well, the story behind it is that while I was designing this building, I'm a Mahatma Gandhi fan. Okay. <laughs> and I wanted a picture of Mahatma Gandhi out there. I brought in the artist, told them to do this, and left India for the US. And when I come back, I see my picture here. So I called the guys and they said, look, we wanted you here. And so this picture has uh, 59,600 nails and five kilometers of nylon on it. That's why you can tell even from a distance in terms of the texture that it's incredibly unique. Well, it's, it's been a wonderful experience walking around the office. Um, Robin, you know, you talked to me so candidly about your journey as an Indian who really succeeded in his corporate career in the US. I want to understand some of the struggles that you went through. Let me first answer a question you didn't ask. You said <laughs> success. I don't consider myself successful mm. uh, simply because wealth doesn't give you success. Your peace of mind gives you success. Sure. So having said that, in terms of to achieve whatever little I achieved in business, did I have to make tough decisions? Absolutely. Mm. I don't think my decisions were cutthroat. My decisions were more based on fundamentals, basics, okay. doing the right thing for my shareholders, doing the right thing for the business, getting rid of certain people, adding new people. I've never been shy of decision making. Where did you sort of uh, gain that uh, you know, gain that trait of making those quick decisions, hard decisions. Uh, uh, where did you find that from? I believe that I inherited it in a way from okay. my dad, who's who's was a tough decision maker. And then I, as I, while I was working in India, I worked with a gentleman called Mr. Arun Sinha, who I call still my guru. Uh, Mr. Sinha just taught me that the basics in life are as long as you do the right thing and you don't want to harm people in your mind, you have every right to take the toughest decision and, and do it with honesty. Sure. Do you feel that India has matured, uh, you know, since you last remember it in terms of where we're at in the financial space, uh, you know, the, the, in terms of the regulations, the, the knowledge, uh, the speed at which things are happening? Undoubtedly, I think the, India has come a long way from where it was. Can their country do better? I do believe so. I, I think India needs to rationalize their tax structures, India needs to reduce bureaucracy. But I think Modi government is on the right path. They've tried. They're trying. I clearly uh, applaud their efforts. Robin, it was a pleasure uh, spending the day with you here at the EVIX office. Thank you for showing us around and we look forward to all that you plan to do with EVIX Cash. Thank you. Thank you.